Good morning. Open your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. One of the things you may have noticed as you came in the, the uh, auditorium this morning, there are little notes around on various pews. This is the not the first time that our kids have done this. I saw a note a few weeks ago that said, uh, you look good, and I thought, well, why is that not in my seat? Uh, it was not. But there's some up here this morning. This one says, be happy. Another says, you are loved. Uh, one of the classes that our kids are in is uh, a place where they're being taught to make a difference in the world. It's not just about learning. It's also about giving and about serving. And so that's their a way of encouraging you today and I would tell you that if there's one in front of you and you'd like to take that home that's what they're for it might be an amazing thing that God puts you in a certain spot today for the note that you might have in front of you before we get started I just want to remind you one more time that men's retreat and women's retreat is coming up quickly uh, men's retreat is obviously the best but if you can't go to that one you can go to the ladies retreat <laughs> that's the following week both of those are just great opportunities um, just to get to know folks. Neither one is going to be awkward nor in any sort of force you to do anything, but it's going to be a great way to just enjoy and hang out and engage as much as you'd want. So if you haven't been or if you have and haven't signed up, I just want to encourage you one last time, be sure and do that. I believe that you'll be blessed if you do. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Would you join me? Lord, we thank you for today and for the opportunity to worship you, to be reminded of who you are and reminded about how you see us. Lord, we ask now for your help, for your leading as we open your word. Lord, we want to be who you call us to be. So we pray that you would show us, that you would lead us, and that you would lift us up. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we've been talking about discipleship, and the word disciple is a follower, and we've been saying that the word and the idea can simply and profoundly be defined as following Jesus. Because if we are not following Jesus, then this is just some sort of strange, disconnected religion without any relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why I say it's also profound is because Jesus accepts us exactly where we are, wherever we are. However, he refuses to leave us that way. For if we're going to follow Jesus, let me say it this way, Jesus doesn't stand still. He's moving. And so if you're going to follow him, you're going to have to keep walking. And so when we say that he takes us just as we are, but he calls us to be like him. Well, how much difference is there between you and him? Probably quite a bit, am I right? So it's a long journey. It's a lifetime. It's a long process by which we continue to trust Jesus and experience his presence in our life. Now in John chapter 1, we see how it begins. When he sees these first people and he calls them to be disciples, there are some that are sent to him by John the Baptist. In verse 38 in John chapter 1, And Jesus turned, and he saw them following, and he said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. That's the first step. The first thing that we have to do is display enough interest to show up to come and, and see, to learn who Jesus is, to learn where he's staying, where he's going, and what he calls us to be. However, if we never move past come and see, we will remain simply spectators. Folks on the edge that just want to watch. But that's not all that Jesus calls us to. Turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, another passage that we looked at in our study over the last few weeks. The chapter begins, it's a long chapter, begins with Jesus being incredibly popular. He feeds a massive multitude and people come and he is so popular they want to make him king even against him, his will. But then Jesus challenges them to say, you're only coming because you ate the bread. The only reason that you're here is for the free lunch. The only reason you're here is to see what happens next. So as long as there's a spectacular miracle or some personal benefit or, or some meal involved, I'm there because I'm still in the come and see. 
But Jesus challenges them to to no longer be spectators, but to be disciples. When he says in verse 53, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. We may begin with come and see, but we must learn to hunger for him, to be desirous of him, that he lives in us and that we live in him. That causes a change. There are people that go, wait a minute. I mean, I didn't mind as long as it was fun to watch and interesting to be around and the food was pretty good. I mean, it was bread and fish, but it was pretty good. And so I, I, I like that. And what happens is we're merely consumers or spectators as long as it pleases us. But Jesus said, you have no life in yourself. The only way you're going to have life is if you take me. It causes people to stumble. In fact, in verse 60 we read, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? This is hard. I thought this was the fun part. I thought this was always about blessing. I thought this was always about everything would be positive. This is difficult, and it's the moment. It's the moment that disciples choose whether or not they will follow him. He continues to emphasize how important this is so that in verse 66 we read, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. No longer disciples. They're not following him. They may say they like him. They may say that they're interested in him, but they just stopped following, didn't they? Well, actually, Jesus turns to the 12 in verse 67, and he says, you don't want to go away also, do you? Now, what's interesting is Jesus doesn't plead with the crowd nor the 12 to stay. Did you notice that? This is probably the point where I might have thought or we might have said, well, now let, let, let me rephrase that. Let's, uh, let's talk about this, or here's some good reasons why. What Jesus simply says is, so are you going to? And one of the things I'm going to be asking along this conversation today, why is he doing this? Why does Jesus call us to difficult things? I mean, I thought he loved us. Is it that he looks at our life and we're doing so well and things are so smooth and things are so happy that he's like, you know, i got to make your life miserable. That's what I need to do. Because I'm going to ask you, why is he calling us to such difficult things? Well, when he asked this question of the twelve, in verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. See, he'd begun that conversation with, you have no life in yourself. It only comes from me. And Peter says, there's nowhere else to go. There's no one else to go to. In fact, he continues to say, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Perhaps in a picture we can see this moment of discipleship in the 11th chapter of John. Flip over there, if you would. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. It's an amazing chapter. It's one that begins with John telling us that Lazarus had become sick, and he was so sick that his sister sent word to Jesus, come and and heal him, the one whom you love is sick. And you know that Jesus delayed, he didn't go, Lazarus dies. Jesus finally comes later, and you remember Mary and Martha, the two sisters come out, and they both separately say kind of the same thing. If you had been here, he wouldn't have died, which implies, why didn't you? Sounds like difficult times. Why didn't you? And Jesus talks about it, that they would believe in him, that they would have the resurrection and life eternal. And then he says, remember, when when he goes to the tomb, he says, move the stone. And one of the sisters says, whoa. Now, he's been in the tomb four days. We don't want to do that. And Jesus said, didn't I tell you, if you believe that you will see the great work of God? They moved the stone, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes forth healed, resurrected, and alive. And what an amazing celebration by the end of the chapter. But in the middle of that, there's one of the disciples. His name is Thomas. And everybody knows Thomas. What's his name, nickname? He is Doubting Thomas. 
Because in the end of John, in chapter 20, Jesus appears to the disciples in the upper room, but Thomas wasn't there on some errand, I guess. And Jesus shows up, and they're all shocked, and he says, look, the wound to Messiah, the wound's on my hand. Don't, don't be afraid, but believe. Peace be with you, and he leaves. Well, Thomas comes back in the room, and hey, how's, you, how's everything? And they say, you're not going to believe it. The Lord was just here. And Thomas said, well, now, unless I can see the wounds on his hands and put my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe. And that's where we nicknamed him Doubting Thomas. But to be honest, all Thomas asked for was what everybody else saw. And you know that's true because a second time Jesus appears in the upper room, and he looks right at Thomas and he says, come over here and see the wounds in my hand and put your hand in my side. And you know what Thomas does? He collapses right there and he says, my Lord and my God. He, when he gets the same information that the others do, he's convinced. Doubting Thomas is probably an unfair nickname. Because look what happens in chapter 11. Because in John chapter 11, the Jews are already mad at him. They're already plotting to destroy him. They already want to kill him. And so when Jesus says, we've got to go to Bethany because Lazarus has fallen asleep, the disciples are like, fallen asleep? In fact, the Jews were just trying to stone you, so we don't need to go back. And so the, the area, the context of Bethany is dangerous. It's hostile. And so you can imagine the disciples are like, why are we going to a place to literally risk our lives because somebody slept through their alarm clock? I mean, they'll wake up. What's the big deal? And Jesus speaks plainly and says, Lazarus is dead. Verse 14, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So he's going to go to a place that literally risks all of their lives. Now, you're a disciple, and you, you're not picking this up. You're confused. So Lazarus is asleep, but he's dead. But why did you say he's asleep? And, 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 and what do we do about the Jews? And so here is a hostile environment, and they are at least missing some of this, if not absolutely confused on what Jesus is about to do. And what does Thomas say? He's the only one that does in the next verse. Therefore, Thomas, who is called Didymus, or the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. Well, that's not very doubting, is it? Jesus said, I'm going, and if you're a disciple, then you follow. Jesus said, I'm going, and they tried to talk him out of it, like, are you sure this is necessary? Because this is going to be bad. Jesus said, well, I'm going, and Thomas says, I tell you what, I'm going too. That's the moment when a disciple becomes a follower rather than merely a spectator. It's a moment when you finally say, I'm in. Regardless of the context, regardless of how much you understand, we kind of want to say, well, tell me everything I'm signing up for before I sign up on the bottom, sign the bottom line, right? What's the fine print? What's the expectation? What else is going to be in here? Discipleship is when we have that moment when we say, if that's where he's going, I'm going to. Well, you know we're going to die. Well, then I guess we're going to die. There's surrender there. Now, my question continues to be the same. Why does Jesus put them in such a situation? Could he, couldn't he not have at least explained it and said, look, just so you guys know, we're going to be fine. Nobody's going to attack us. I'll make sure that happens. And we're going to get over there, and I'm going to raise Lazarus from the dead, and everybody's going to be excited, so let's go. I mean, that's the minimum that I would require, am I right? If you're asking me to do something that I don't want to do, then it's hard. I want to at least know what's going to happen. Jesus doesn't do that. Why not? I would think it would help. Why not? Thomas becomes a disciple in that moment. Flip over to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and he says it this way. In Luke chapter 9, he's talked about how he's got to go to the cross, how he's going to suffer, how he's going to be resurrected. And then in verse 23, he says this, Luke 9, verse 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
Now remember, when Jesus uses the word cross, it is not yet any kind of symbol of victory. For Jesus has not yet suffered on the cross, been buried and resurrected. So all the disciples can hear is, <gasps> crucifixion? Even in English today, if you have a, a headache that is so bad that no, no amount of Tylenol or whatever will touch it, if it's so bad that just blinking hurts and someone says, how's your headache? You might say, it is excruciating. That's the English word we use to try to, try to describe the most painful experience we've ever had. And so when Jesus says, you got to take up your cross, it's associated with pain and with shame. There's no victory yet. And he says, this is what has to happen if you're going to follow me. Well, the disciples have said, if we go back to Bethany, we're going to get beat up. We're going to be imprisoned. We're going to be stoned. We're going to be killed. Sounds like it would be uncomfortable. And what did Thomas say? He's going, I'm going. And we'll just deal with what happens. Jesus says, this is what's necessary. Why? Why is he doing this? Is it Jesus' intent to cause you as much pain and suffering as possible? Didn't Jesus say just in the previous chapter, John chapter 10, verse 10, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly or have it full? Wasn't wasn't it God's intent? Did he not place Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Not in some scorching desert filled with scorpions and whatever else? So if God's intent is for what is good for us, then why does he talk like this? Why does he require this? Verse 24. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake is the one who will save it. For what does a man profit it if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Why is such a death necessary in order to experience life? Let's try Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. As you're turning to Romans chapter 8, he had already talked about at the end of chapter 7, this frustration of this enslavement to sin. He even ends the chapter by saying, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? And then in Romans chapter 8, it begins to praise God because we do not come under condemnation because of the love of Christ, but rather we are filled with the Spirit. And then notice, if you would, verse 12. Romans 8, verse 12. Paul says, so then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. God put us in the Garden of Eden. That was his intent. But we decided it wasn't good enough. We said, yeah, yeah, the garden's fine, but I want more. I want to be like God. I want to make my own decisions. And we do it over and over and over. Even now, do we not struggle to do our own will? Don't we decide to do what we want to do? Don't we make our own choices because God's will isn't good enough? And so we live entrapped and ensnared. For it is Jesus' intent to rescue us. One of the hard things about life is sometimes we don't even know we're trapped. We live in a cage and we think it's freedom. And so what Jesus wants to do is to bring us to life, to bring us to the abundant life. How's he going to do it? See, in order for us to truly live, we have got to let go. When we insist on our own will, when we follow our own selfishness, when we follow our own appetites to the detriment of others, he has got to get us loose from ourselves for the greatest idol in our lives is ourself. There has to be a moment when we finally let go, when we finally surrender, when we finally say, I'm done with having to have it my way. There has to be a death in order to experience life. 
He says in verse 13, For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He doesn't leave it up to us to do it by ourselves. What we have to do is to surrender, to submit, to allow God. And then He does the hard part, the heavy lifting, the transformation, the change. You and I know what it's like to try to make ourselves better. This is February. Where are you on your New Year's resolutions to be a better you? In January, all the gyms were full of people committed to being different. And in February, you can use any machine you want to at any time. We know this. And so Paul says that you've got to put to death the deeds of the body. That's our responsibility. That's what has to die. And then we must allow the Spirit to work. Verse 14, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. Because we've already been there. We know what it's like to live in fear. We know what it's like that every action and decision in our lives is about what we're afraid of. We're afraid of failure. We're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of pain. He says, that's not what this is. In fact, he says, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons. The beautiful word here, adoption, means that God chose you. Did you get to choose your siblings? If you could have, would you have chose differently? The word here is adoption because God said, I want this one. I chose you. You're not an accident, neither in creation nor in salvation. And that's why he says we cry out, Abba, Father. We talked about that word a few weeks ago. The word Abba is like, the English word is like daddy, but it just it doesn't carry enough because it's beautiful when kids were little, but it starts losing its umph as we get older. It's a word that means this closeness and intimacy with God as our Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Turn over to Romans chapter 6, if you would. Turn back a couple of chapters. Romans chapter 6. We must deny ourselves. And it's going to be hard. That's why it says, take up your cross. Yours is going to look a little different than mine. Because your idol looks more like you than it does me. And mine looks more like me than it does you. That's not going to be easy. And so it's going to require a Thomas moment when we say, I'm in. I'm done. I've followed my own way. I've, I've followed my own thoughts. I've I've withheld forgiveness, I've, I've been selfish, I've been unloving, I'm, I'm done with that. Until that happens, we will never experience the freedom of discipleship. We'll only know the enslavement of sin and religion. Religion is identified by all the stuff you have to do in order to get right. Relationship is about who you've got to be with in order to to be right. In Romans 6, Paul asks this question in the first verse. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? That's the only way you escape is through such death. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, if we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. If we've become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified. Listen to the strong, even violent language the Bible uses to describe this Thomas moment. It doesn't come easy. There is a fierce battle that must be waged against ourselves. Our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. 
So what does it look like? If you have a Thomas moment, if you finally get past come and see as a spectator and move toward this piece, for Jesus begins with come and see, but he calls us all the way to come and die with me. He says, until then, we don't experience the life that we've been trying to find. So turn to Galatians chapter 5. Finally, if you would, Galatians chapter 5 as we read about what this would look like. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. And then he talks about these are the things that must die. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality. Everything in our culture drives us by sensuality. Everything is about how we feel. We want to do what makes us feel good. We want to do what brings us pleasure. We even identify truth by how we feel about it. Everything is about our senses and about what we experience in our emotion and feeling. He said that must be put to death. That we must develop something deeper than just how we feel. Does that negate emotion? No. But it frees us from being enslaved to emotion. Anybody gotten emotional in a relationship? Anybody ever been frustrated in a relationship? Does anybody know what it like, knows what it's like to love somebody desperately and also be upset with them at the same time? Anybody? Don't look side to side, just look right here. <laughs> right? So we understand this. We need something more than just how it makes us feel because if we have something underneath it, then we have the freedom to feel really good and the freedom to get past the times when we don't feel so good. He said, you've got to put to death this enslavement to sensuality. He says some more, idolatry. We're not like that. We're not so small-minded. We carve some chunk of tree somewhere and then fall down and call it God. No, we do better than that. We take a piece of glass, we put some metal on the back so we can see ourselves clearly, and then we say, this is our idol. Ourselves. That's why we must deny ourselves and take up our cross. Sorcery, enmities, listen to the next three in verse 20. Strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, even disputes, dissensions, factions. We long for community. We desire close friendships and relationships, and yet we destroy it with our own hands of jealousy and envy and factions and disputes and arguments and outbursts of anger the very thing we long for we destroy with both hands these things must be put to death we may have to get aggressive about it we may have to get wound up about it I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to get in these kinds of arguments. I'm not going to create division in the community that God has given me. I'm not going to be serving myself. It doesn't matter if I like it, don't like it. It doesn't matter if I feel good about it, don't feel good about it. If that's where he's going, then that's where I'm going. And whatever happens, I will trust him with the outcome. He talks about envying and drunkenness. Drunkenness is not just the obvious drugs and alcohol. The word means to be impaired or to be numbed. That we regularly reach for things to numb or push away what we don't want to deal with. You can get drunk with drugs and alcohol. You can get drunk with ice cream. And you can get drunk with the internet. You can watch YouTube till your mind goes blank. Searching for something else to entertain you or interest you so you don't have to deal with what you're being called to deal with. It's all kinds. He says it's got to be put to death. Carousing. And things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, if we are still spectators, if we're just going to come and see, but we're still living in these things, he says we cannot inherit the kingdom that we will not experience an abundant life, that we will not experience the presence of the Spirit in our life because we've never had our Thomas moment. We will continue to be entrapped in the idolatry of self 
and in the emptiness of religion until we finally say, I will die with him. It's helpful, though, that he doesn't leave us with just that. Don't do those things. Okay. That was most of what I did. So now I'll just stare at the wall, I guess. You remember several decades ago when we began the war on drugs, and one of the messages was, don't do drugs. All right, it's a good message. Now what am I supposed to do? Because if we, de- if we deny ourselves, if we take up our cross, if we die to Jesus, if we have the Thomas moment, we're going to follow Jesus. He's going somewhere. Jesus isn't just standing there. He's going somewhere. We're going to follow him. Then what do we need to do? If we put to death these things, what do we need to do? Well, he tells us, verse 22, but put the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. You heard all that ruckus and division and factions and envying and strife and jealousy. This brings a deep serenity. This brings freedom. If you're busy in your life being jealous and envious and factious and divisive, then how deep do you ever go? You're too busy avoiding and calculating and responding and reacting. But if you could be in a community where there's love and joy and peace and kindness, then how deep could could you go? Such freedom allows us to experience the work of the Spirit. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. May we be wise enough to identify what the passion is we're feeling so that we know whether to nurture it or kill it. To feed it or deny it. The reason that Jesus calls us to this is he longs for us to experience freedom in his love. That's why he put us in the Garden of Eden. It's the only way back is a relationship with Christ. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, or envying one another. For even as we walk in the Spirit, it is our nature to be comparing ourselves with each other. I don't know if you noticed in the bulletin, but next week we're having a contest of which disciples can be the most humble. (laughs) It just doesn't work, does it? In the same way, he said that the work of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is patience. We're also patient with each other. We're not going to compare ourselves to one another. Rather, we compare ourselves to Christ. That's why we don't judge each other. You should be better than that, brother, because I'm better than you. And it's also why we don't say, no, I'm doing pretty good. Because we're not following each other. We're following Jesus. He's the only one that matters. And that's what brings us the community, the harmony, and the freedom that we long for. So I don't know. Is there anything you need to put to death in your life? Have you had your Thomas moment? It's not just one time. That's why Jesus says, deny yourself and take up your cross daily. Because there's always going to be another time where we're going to have to say, nope, I'm going with him. Ooh, I don't like how this is looking. Doesn't matter. I'm going with him. And I don't like how this makes me feel. Doesn't matter. I'm going with him. Because where he's going is love, peace, joy, kindness, self-control. That's where I'm going. Well, who's going to look out for me? How do I know what's going to happen? I'm going to surrender the outcome. I'm going to release the future into his hands. And I am going to grow from come and see to come and die with me. Are you having a Thomas moment this morning? If you are, remember he said, let us go that we may die with him. Because we're all trying to go that same place. We're all trying to follow him. If we can encourage you like Thomas did his brothers, we'd like to do that. We invite you to one of these front pews. You can go out in the foyer and meet with a shepherd there on the left side of the foyer on the way out. As Jesus calls you to come and to die with him. As together we stand and sing.